Hey everyone, and welcome to our live show, Lead Your Movement. I'm Angelique Rewers, CEO and founder of The Corporate Agent, and this is our weekly live show, Lead Your Movement, where we interview top business leaders and entrepreneurs who are using their business and their organizations in order to drive amazing change in the world. And today we have another phenomenal episode for you talking about something that's going to impact the corporate world, the higher education world, the government world, the small business owner world, the startup world, and everything in between for the foreseeable future, if not for decades to come. And that is the idea of employees working from home, full-time, permanently, on a regular basis, and how that is shifting the entire business world. And to do that, to talk about what that means for all of us, particularly those of you who are in the coaching business, the consulting business, keynote speakers, trainers, and others out there, we have with us today one of the top experts, if not the top expert on this topic in the entire world, and that is Tara Powers, who is the CEO and founder of Powers Resource Center. So let me give Tara a proper introduction today. Tara is CEO and founder of Powers Resource Center, and she is on a mission to help fast-growing companies and socially responsible organizations organizations, including major global brands that you all know and love to develop cohesive teams and build leadership agility in a virtual environment. Her commitment to her clients is to serve as a catalyst for change, to be the business partner that takes your team collaboration, employee engagement, and leadership credibility to the next level and to deliver results that make you want to do the happy dance. Tara, welcome. Thank you so much. So grateful to be here today. I'm, I'm so grateful to have you here. Been loving your show, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot to talk about, especially, there is. On this, right? There's always a lot to talk about yeah. when it comes to working with corporations and, and using business in order to affect change in the world. But we're living through really a historic time right now. But before we get into working from home, leading remote teams, I start every episode by asking our guest, what is the movement that you are leading? Yeah, thank you. So my movement and is really to build a culture of connection at work. And that um, loneliness is an epidemic. It's uh, something that is really an issue in our society. And we spend a lot of our time during the day with each other. And so my passion has always been to help people understand how do we build a strong, authentic connection with other people. And so that is our movement is really building a culture of connection at work. Amazing. So we're in the middle of this pandemic. Yeah. It's been a few months now since almost every company in the world had to start sending all of their employees to work from home for mm -hmm. what in the beginning was an indefinite period of time. And I would say that that really that mile marker of when we're going back to the office just continues to move further and further yeah. out. So how does connection play into this world that we all live in now? How do you create a connection in a workplace when we're all separate? Yeah, it takes an incredible uh, amount of thought and intention that we may not have been used to. And it also really requires a shift to more of an empathetic way of leading um, that we're, that I think, you know, we haven't really valued as much in the past. So when you think about what do we need from leaders of remote teams, it really is more of that right brain kind of, of thinking, which is really around emotional intelligence, empathy, being able to recognize when something's off with someone on my team, just by seeing what's going on with their body language over a camera, right? Or checking in with them more often or asking better questions about how people are doing. Um, getting to know your employees better so that you kind of have an idea of what they're facing in their home environment, especially, you know, with kids home and not knowing what's going to happen with a lot of schools around the country, some people taking care of aging, elderly, sick parents, or possibly even someone that has COVID in their house. 
So it really does require this heavy dose of empathy, understanding, emotional intelligence, and intentional connection, which which uh, it needs to become a priority, basically. But a lot of this really is not common sense and intuitive. In fact, right mm -hmm. after companies uh, started sending people home, your phone started ringing off the hook. And I wow. should tell our audience, you know, for the last 20 years, you've been working with major organizations, not just in the nonprofit and higher education world, with, but with some of the biggest brands in the world. You've worked with McDonald's, you've worked with Caterpillar, you've worked with Mrs. Fields Cookies. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you know, these brands that, that you've worked with um, are really the household names that that everyone knows yeah. and when the pandemic hit and companies started sending their employees home particularly in companies that very rarely used remote working or mm -hmm. you know tele telecommuting remember that term telecommuting oh yeah it's gone out it's the so world. Old. yeah um, so it's so dated but you know your phone started ringing off the hook from these companies. They knew that you were the preeminent expert on helping organizations to effectively manage and lead remote teams. Take me inside some of those conversations. What were they afraid of? What were they asking you? Where did they see their leadership feeling overwhelmed? What were those conversations like? Yeah. So we'll look at it from a couple of different perspectives. One is the employee perspective. So employees who have not traditionally worked from home now are working in their most private space, right? Their, their home, perhaps some of them have an office, perhaps some don't. One of the biggest issues early on was the uncomfortableness of kind of opening up my personal world to mm -hmm. all the people over the screen. So that was an issue to even get people to turn on their camera. Um, and I think as we continue with this remote work from home, um, you know, environment that we're going to, we're going to be in for a long time, uh, that, that is going to be something people are, they are working through that and getting more comfortable with it. But the, the key here is that I also think it provides us this sense of knowing someone at a little bit of a deeper level than we did when they were in the office, because we are sharing their home, so to speak, with them, right? So that was one issue, um, was that just the level of comfort of employees was, was a problem. So these companies were calling me and saying, how do we help them get comfortable? And so it really boils down to understanding what builds trust between human beings, right? And one of the most important ways we build trust is by being able to see each other and see when someone's smiling and nodding in agreement. And those things are still so very important. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have your cameras on 20 all, for every meeting, but it is very important to build that kind of trust and connection. The second issue was uh, the, something I don't think you, we've brought it up yet, but are people actually doing anything? Are they, are they sitting at home eating bonbons all day or what are they doing? And so um, that really, to me, is just a leadership capability and, and a leadership best practice. So leaders who traditionally were in the office and maybe tended to be micromanagers or looking over their employees' shoulders or checking in on how they're doing on a regular you know, basis several times a day have to now get better very quickly at setting clear expectations, defining what success looks like, um, agree, having agreements in place of what does participation look like? What does it mean to show up on our virtual meetings and in our virtual calls? What does that mean to all of us? And so that was another key thing that these companies were saying, what, what are the immediate tools we need to give these managers so that they can make sure work's getting done uh, and we're still, you know, moving forward and progressing. And so those are some of the things that I focused on was helping employees get more comfortable and helping managers kind of put in place some really key agreements early on. That's amazing. So I just want to point out we are live today. And so we've got some great comments here from Nancy and Pat. So if you're watching us live and you want us to take a question from you or you just want to share your experience or tell us you disagree or tell us you agree, we certainly encourage you to do that while we're live today. So it's interesting that you're bringing up some of those things. We've been doing voice of the customer interviews, as you know, with corporate leaders of major brands, mid-market companies here at the corporate agent for the last couple of months. We're continuing to stay in touch with 
with with business leaders, um, be included in some closed door conversations around companies that are really committed to an evolved culture in their organizations. Mm -hmm. And some of the things we've heard, Tara, um, one of the things that sort of amused me was that senior leaders were a little bit surprised at a lot of corporations. We actually heard this a lot out of Australia and Europe, but in the United States as well, that senior leaders were actually really surprised that their engagement numbers went up once employees start working from home. They were actually higher. People were really engaged, really yeah. you know, connected. They were working really hard and really, you know, just that true definition of engagement of that discretionary effort that employees were given. They were very surprised by that. Mm -hmm. The other big surprise that we heard, and I'd love to hear your take on this is that employees felt like they could see their bosses as, you know, in some companies more human because they could see into their boss's office and yeah. they were showing up in t-shirts instead of a yeah. suit and tie. They were more <laughs> relaxed. You know, the cat or the dog was in the office mm -hmm. and it actually turned out to be a good thing, not yeah. a bad thing. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of echoing what I was saying. This idea of getting comfortable with seeing into people's personal lives has been a actual benefit, even though at first people were really uncomfortable it is a benefit. Actually, one of the big brands you mentioned that I worked with shared with me uh, that their VP, one of their VPs on a senior leadership meeting, their three-year-old ran past the screen naked, you know, screaming, ah, with his toys. And it just allows you this opportunity to go, this person is a real person with similar issues, right? We're all in this together. That idea that we are all dealing with many of the same stressors, regardless of our level in a company, it creates this sense of camaraderie that I don't think was there before when you had people, you know, who had the corner office and then everybody else had their, you know, desks in the middle of the, of the, uh, office. It was, a, it really did create that more of that us, them, kind of feeling and that some of that goes away with this virtual environment, which I think is fantastic. It's, that is great. That's a huge boon. And then to address your first um, comment about people getting more done, absolutely we're getting more done. And the number one reason is we don't have all the distractions, right? Now we do have obviously the distractions of our kids and our, um, you know, pets and what the, what, what have you, but the lack of distraction that we normally have in the office allows you to really focus and get some work done. Um, also, if you think about the amount of time people were commuting, in some cases, 90 minutes a day, longer than an hour a day. Um, I think the average commute was 45 minutes a day. So it's an hour and a half in your car where you were not able to spend time with your family. You weren't able to get home for dinner. You weren't able to get home for the kids' soccer game uh, or whatever that might be. I think people are now able to juggle a lot more of their responsibilities in an easier way. Things flow better when we constantly don't have to be going 10 different places. So. Um, that also, I think, allows for people to be more focused and on when they're at work. Other side of that is that is the biggest issue with employees who are working remotely is that they do not know how to turn it off. So this be, has become a problem. It always has been, but now obviously it's being exacerbated oh, yeah. uh, just because everybody's working from home. But there is an unspoken expectation sometimes from the employee that I'm just supposed to be on all the time. I should be checking email at nine at night while I'm in bed because I'm working from home now. And actually that's not true. I really uh, encourage and train all employees at every level to have a ritual for starting your day and ending your day because it actually does impact your brain and what how you think and feel about work. And for some people that's a walk outside and then I sit down at my designated work area and start my day. At the end of the day, I take another walk to end my day. That is something as simple and as that. And get the wine. And get the wine. And that's get the wine. Right. Absolutely. That, have that. I'm like, yeah. that, that's in the manual, yeah. right? Like Santa Maria <laughs> at 530. Yeah. 
actually, it was, I'll just share this. Uh, I've heard so many wonderful stories about how leaders and teams are staying connected. And um, this one leader said, yeah, I mailed wine and some chocolates, really delicious organic chocolates to all of my team member and uh, team members. And on a Thursday night, uh, we sat down after work and we had a wine and chocolate tasting. And I thought that was that, you know, it also offers a couple opportunities for businesses when you think about all the ways we can connect with food and wine in a virtual environment. And so we'll talk about that too. But yeah, no, yeah. It, you know, so what's really interesting, and we've been hearing some of the same things as well, that companies are both faced with new problems that they haven't had before. We are hearing, especially in the consulting space, uh, the corporate consulting, IT consulting, those big sort of systems integrators, mm -hmm. you know, they've talked about the fact that people are getting a little burned out because they're not ending their work day. Yeah. A lot of times the commute represented sort of a mental switch yeah. between office and home. Not that we're not all connected with our cell phones, but there was still that decompression time mm -hmm. in the car for 45 minutes before you walked in the door and your spouse was walking in the door and, you know, you had a chance maybe to listen to some music or listen yep. to the news or something and, and decompress that's gone now. Um, and so one of the things that we're hearing from companies is they're putting in place some policies um, some guidelines about certain things. I, you know, I'll share with you some of the things we're hearing. I'd love mm -hmm. to hear some of the policies that you're hearing go into place. One is that some of the major corporations are really asking their senior leaders not to be emailing their team members super late because Correct. then it's setting the expectation that their employees have to be responding. Yep. That they can't check out. Another one we're hearing is not to apologize for how you look on camera, that you're not, you know, camera ready, to not apologize if your dog or cat does something. And most importantly, we're hearing don't apologize for your kids, because if your kids yeah. hear you apologizing, yes. it's really going to hurt them. Yeah. And we, you know, we can't, we can't do that. So some companies are being really enlightened. Others mm -hmm. are not, you know, there's a university here in, in South Florida that I actually just read about this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You talk about it. This is ridiculous. This is yeah. outrageous. Go yeah. ahead. Talk about yeah. it. So I read, uh, yeah, and obviously it must be the same article where they basically told their professors that if you cannot, um, guarantee a uh, environment in your home that is free of distractions, kids, barking pets, et cetera. You can't work here. Right. right? Pretty yeah. much. They, yeah. they basically said, do something with your, get rid of your pets and yep. your like, you can't <laughs> yeah. have them at home yeah. and we're not going to keep you on payroll if you can't, yeah. but you know, you can't have your kids at home and you working. And I think it went for both faculty and staff, mm -hmm. you know, both mm -hmm. the faculty and the staff, which is just, um, absolutely outrageous. And to, to Jacques point here from an IT perspective, companies also have to rethink how they're implementing their home policies yes. um, and their asset management yes. policies. I One of the stories I told on our recent Seize Your Moment uh, seminar that we did was that there was a company, a several hundred thousand person corporation that I talked to some senior leaders from, and they had to get all of their employees in India. I think it was 150,000 employees in India to get their Laptop. desktop computers. Yeah. Well, they didn't have laptops. The That's, world was yes. out of laptops because everybody was buying laptops. So they had to get 150,000 employees to put their desktop computers and monitors on their lap on motorcycles nice. and get those home within a three-day period before you weren't even allowed to be on the streets anymore. Yep. Yep. And so there's a lot of policies. What are mm -hmm. some of the policies before we kind of change gears? What yeah. are some policies that companies need to be looking at having in place? Yeah, there's there's many and I'm sure I won't even cover all of them that are coming up. But you mentioned a lot. I mean, one is a security issue, right? With having people work at home, their companies really need to look at their security information policies. This is actually a huge concern because we do not know how secure people's internet is, right? How secure, what, what are the software systems they're using to send information to each other? That is a real opportunity for hackers, obviously, to get some sensitive information. So that's a big one. Um, the second is certainly 
uh, one, one that you were mentioning, which is an availability policy. What are our expectations around uh, availability of our employees. You know, one of the things I think people need to think about when we were in the office, we were not available eight hours a day, right? We were, we were doing things. We were taking a break. We were going to lunch. We were in meetings. We were talking to team members down in the next floor. Um, and this expectation that if you're working eight to five, I should be able to get in connection with you at any minute of the day is not um, acceptable. It's just not reasonable. And so the policy needs to move from quantity of work to quality of mm -hmm. work, right? So we need to, as leaders and even as companies, to start to set expectations and policies around the quality of work. Because I can get way more done in four hours here at my home office than I ever could in eight hours in an office with surrounded by 300 people. So uh, quality is a biggie. Um, some other key policies are, I think, uh, companies who are enlightened are looking at health and wellness. How are we taking care of ourselves? A lot of the companies that I'm working with, they are instituting or at least making it voluntary at this point where teams are uh, starting health challenges such as 10,000 steps a day and they choose a meeting a day, that's a walking meeting, right? Where they're walking together. So we really have to be thinking about the health and wellness of our employees. Are they able to, are they able to get access to healthy food? Um, you know, are we making sure people are not emailing at night? One of the things that you mentioned, even if a company has a policy in place that we cannot expect employees to be available and be emailing after a certain time, if the manager sets that standard, even if it's a policy, that is an unspoken expectation. Mm -hmm. If my manager sends me an email at 10 at night, there's an unspoken expectation I should respond. So we really have to be thinking about those type of policies. Um, um, and then I just, yeah, availability was the other one I was going to mention. So No, I think that's really true. One of the... Um one of the the practices of, of a company that we just talked to is that they are almost all of their employees are based in the same time zone so that helps right with with what i'm about yes. to say if you're a global company it's getting it's getting trickier and we can talk about that you know there are definitely yeah. uh folks who are having to get up super early because all of their employees are in a certain time zone around the world in fact some of the global corporations the the director levels and above are kind of at a breaking point right yeah. now because they're being invited to all of these meetings that's 24 7 around the world because they operate in every time zone mm -hmm. and uh several even in fact vp said to me angelique i'm working 18 20 hour days right now this yeah is not sustainable, mm -hmm. but our company hasn't figured out sort of what the rules are about when you're expected to join a call in a different time zone versus not join a call in a different time zone. I think that's it's basic yet necessary to have those policies. Conversely, we've heard companies say, we're all in the same time zone and there's absolutely no conference calls or meetings from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Yeah. We uh -huh. want everyone logging off their computer, uh -huh. letting their eyes take a break from the screen, go yep. for a walk. Um, one of my employees, one day I, I touched base with them. They were out running. I'm like, great. Call me when you're back. Like you're out for lunch. Yep. Right, great. Because it's going to clear your head. You're going to come back and you're going to feel great in the afternoon, you know, which is what we want people to do. Um I want to ask you about one key thing, and then I want to change uh, directions a little bit because you have built an unbelievable platform. You've done four or five things that are ridiculously innovative and powerful that helped get your phone ringing off the hook from these companies when they went to this virtual work environment. You have three or four more things that are coming up in the next, you know, three, six months that I want you to share with folks because I think it's going to really help them in leading their own movements. But before I do that, one of the biggest things that's coming up now, we've got some companies forcing employees to go back. The Wall Street Journal just wrote a great piece on that this morning. If you guys didn't see that in the energy and the oil and gas industry, they're really seeing pressure to get people back into the office. A lot of people, especially baby boomers, are resistant because they're afraid for their life. Right. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, you have startups 
startups who are letting leases expire mm -hmm. and saying, we might just stay virtual for the next couple of years. We're going to, you know, we're going to see this might be a new permanent thing for us. But one interesting piece of feedback we've gotten from quite a number of companies is that there is something that is lost in virtual. Yeah. There's a lot that's gained, right? There, yep. you know, there's that whole thing where you were on a plane and for every hour of flight, it was like equal to two hours of work because there's no interruptions when you're on a flight kind of a thing. It's the same thing. You can get more quality work done. But what's not happening, Tara, are the sort of serendipitous moments where one coworker bumps into another coworker mm -hmm. around the water cooler and they're like, oh, hey, did you hear blah, blah is happening? And they say, no, wait, what's happening? Yeah. Wait, we haven't heard anything about that. Okay, we need to talk about that. And those moments are now being scheduled, but you can't schedule serendipity. Yeah. Like, right? Like serendipity is not scheduled. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. That's, that's the exact opposite. So they're very concerned about the serendipitous nature of overhearing a conversation mm -hmm. and the person getting up from coming. I, I used to do that as a boss. I'd hear something going on out in the hallway and I would realize, wait a second, I just put a radar system on a ship to the, you know, Paris air show. Yeah. And what did you guys just say? Yeah. I call like, uh oh, you know, and I'd run out my office and be like, guys, wait, what did you just say? And so that isn't happening. What do companies do about that? Or do they just have to say, you know, there is nothing we can do? No, about? there is th things you can do. Uh, several uh, things. One is you really need to think about creating this culture of transparency. So everything you do, everybody can see. And one of the things that is, I think, a lost skill that you might be really happy that will, I believe, needs to come back in this virtual environment is getting better at business writing uh, because we need to be tracking these thoughts and ideas uh, somewhere, right? That everyone can see. So that whether that's Slack or whatever tool you're using as a virtual team, um, we need to be making sure we're putting those ideas on paper. We're writing things down more than we used to. So we used to bump into each other and talk about it. We need to now be when we have those thoughts, writing them down. So having some kind of repository for ideas, brainstorms, those type of things, right? So that would be one. Um, the second is something that you mentioned earlier. Uh, companies are having blackout periods for meetings where we're not scheduling meetings. I recommend that at least maybe two, three times a week, you have all in meetings where we mm. just, it's not even a meeting. I don't even want to call it a meeting. It's uh, where we schedule a time one to three on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We just all get on Zoom and work together. We're not even scheduled to talk about anything, but we are collaborating or working virtually together at the same time so that we can ask a question. So if I'm just working with my team on the screen, I could say, hey, Angelique, did you hear about such and such? So we're creating those spaces for some of those uh, conversations to happen and trying to make the, them a little bit more natural, right? Uh, 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 serendipitous, so to speak, as you mentioned. So cre again, being intentional about trying to create some of that space, whether it's um, t using technology or whether it's getting on just an open platform and working side by side virtually where some of those things can happen more often. So those are a couple ways that uh, certainly companies can do that. I also recommend to all the companies I work with, I want you to think about the last time you had a meeting that had nothing to do with your progress updates, with mm -hmm. all your to do's, with your revenue, with, you know, how about we start to get into the practice of looking at the trends in our industry and every week someone else is bringing kind of a little report to the group and then we're just talking about it. We are creating the space to um, let thought leadership rise to the surface, right? What, yeah, where are we creating just to that? Connect. Just yeah. to connect. Yes. And uh, talk about all the changes that constantly are happening daily right now. We should be creating meetings where we're talking about those things. We're, we're bringing in the New York Times article. What does that mean to us? How do you feel about that? 
I love that. Even over lunch, even yeah. saying to people, like, if you want to have lunch together and just talk, I mean, that was one of the things when I worked in the energy industry, um, you know, we would in the defense industry, we actually, can you believe it? You guys, we had a cafeteria on campus. We would all go to the cafeteria, which was such a surreal thing for me uh, from going to, from Northern Virginia to this campus in the middle of nowhere with a, a company cafeteria. And then when I worked in downtown Baltimore, we went out to lunch every day in New York, people go out they did go out to lunch every day. And, you know, it was that idea of, you know, kind of unplugging from work, but sometimes it gives you that creative idea. As Marissa was just saying, you know, it gives you that creativity, that burst of yeah. creativity. And I hope we, I hope we don't lose that because certainly everything being digital can sometimes mess with our brain a little bit. On yeah. That front, for I sure. would like to, to just to add to that, yeah. the technology that is out there that probably a small percentage of companies have even ever tapped into is phenomenal for creativity and brainstorming. Mm. I mean, the, the technology to be able to brainstorm collaboratively in a virtual environment is fantastic. Um, I, I, I like Miro is one that I, and I don't, I have, they, they know I'm saying, I'm not even, uh, you know, selling them at all, but they do some amazing things where you can, collaboratively brainstorm just as if you were standing at a whiteboard together mm. um, and be able to get your ideas up there, move around sticky notes. I mean, it is phenomenal what is available if we get intentional about recreating some of those spaces and times for those ideas to bubble up to the surface. It just needs to be more intentional. That's the, that's the key issue there. I love it. I love it. But there's a lot of great ideas too over here in our feed, you guys, just about the things that companies are doing. Yeah. Uh, someone's company is doing meal prep during yeah. lunch, which is really fantastic and making sure people are taking the time to do that. And it, um, I love that idea about the intentionality of, of it all. And if, you know, now I think you do have to be more, we could also do a whole episode on, and maybe we should on balancing the home requirements with the work. And I know, and we're yeah. going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, but obviously you've got two major school districts, San Francisco and LA uh, that have announced that they're not going back in the fall. It's going to be online uh, here in Palm Beach County. It sounds like County schools are not going back, but our private school is going back. So, you know, and all it's going to take is of course, one outbreak yes. in a school for everything. And then we'll all be back at home again. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be a really, I think the next six months, uh, I think we all have to kind of, you know, strap in for the next, for the next yeah. months. And if here. I just add to that, I mean, obviously this shift of working from home with your family there is a, is a huge shift for most, but it's also this whole work from home, um, you know, movement, so to speak, is really shifting also just cities, the makeup of cities. People are, I don't know if you've been reading about this, but people are, if they can work from anywhere, they're not choosing to live in a small, expensive apartment in New York City or out downtown LA. And so you're seeing kind of this exodus of people that are thinking uh, or have already left cities and moving into more rural areas, which I think you know, that could be a good thing for rural America, right? Where we uh, start to see more of these smaller communities come back, perhaps, uh, because people are moving out of out of the big cities um, because they don't need to be there. Now, that's also not good for cities, right? And all of the things that we enjoy there. But just, you know, thinking about all the things that are shifting. I, I was just reading an article recently where they did a survey from employees in the Bay Area. And they said two in three tech workers said they would choose to move if they could, if they were given the choice. If they didn't have to live there anymore, they would leave. Two out of three. So I think we're going to really see some major shifts if, if this this trend will continue. Well, and that really, I mean, that's, I think this is one of the reasons we're having the show. One of the things we can keep talking about because there were a lot of rent pressures, a lot of yeah. housing pressures in major cities um, like Silicon Valley, where it was so difficult for people to find housing, mm -hmm. New York City and others. If we really do move to a more permanent, flexible work arrangement, it starts to open up really better quality of life yes. for, for humans. We yes. need nature. We need space. Um, we need not to be spending two thirds of a salary on rent, right? Especially single parents and things like that. So, 
every problem creates, you know, opportunity, opportunity, solutions, create new problems. And I think the problems on the other side of the pandemic are actually going to be different, pro very different yes. problems than what we saw before. It's really fascinating. Also, you guys who are listening, think about what this means for your business opportunities. Mm -hmm. Think about what are you Fun. talking to your, you know, your clients about, to your prospects about, to your community about, what are you talking to them about? Because this is all opportunity for you to lead. Um, and I think in so many respects, Tara, we've, you know, the term thought leader yeah. has been so bastardized. Yeah. Um, and the idea that like lifestyle photos make you a thought leader, right? A beautiful $7,000, $10,000 website, expensive photo shoot, right? Makes you a thought leader. Um, and of course, it's like the emperor has no clothes mm -hmm. kind of conversation, yeah. right? You've done some really interesting things. When this pandemic set in, you were really poised. Uh, you had done a lot of things mm -hmm. to be positioned as the expert at hand, as the expert who's hired. You were you had built a reputation uh, as an expert in remote teams. And so you really got a lot of those phone calls. They went to you. Let's go back a couple of years. So for those of you um, who who maybe are not familiar with Tara, Tara, in addition to running her business, she's also our senior faculty of corporate training programs here at The Corporate Agent. And the way I got to know Tara, she was one of my elite level clients for a couple of, ye for a couple of years. And so I've worked really closely with Tara. We Now she's, a, in addition to running her company, she also uh, delivers some of our training programs here at corporate agent. Um, but a couple of years ago, you and I were working together, Tara, you were one of my elite clients. And I recommend it to you that you do something um, to really start to position yourself differently mm -hmm. yes. than some of your competitors. Take us back to that point of what you did. And then we're going to walk through some of those steps that you took subsequently because you've really, it now it's just, I feel like the momentum and it's just getting faster yeah. and faster. For it you. is. It's, it's really, it's like a train yeah. moving so fast and I'm like holding <laughs> on, but uh, yeah, yeah. So a lot of my clients, probably seven years ago, at least it's been now, they were starting to move towards uh, more remote work at the time, telecommuting, hoteling. Mm -hmm. A lot of government clients were hoteling because of the real estate issue. There was no more Can I define state. hoteling? For sure. Folks? So hoteling, you guys, for those of you who are not familiar with that terminology, means that you don't have necessarily um, a, an assigned desk or office that, you know, because you're not always in the office, you are able to kind of sign out a workspace mm -hmm. for the day. So that's what she means by hotel. Yeah, like you would find a cube online, like you would do on a hotel. Hotel, right? Yeah. You go on your reservation system, find a cube. That's where I'm going to go work today. Um, so they were, I was working with their teams and their leaders and they were saying, this is becoming, you know, much more of a frequent occurrence and we're not sure how we need to shift, right? How we need to lead differently. How do we help these teams stay collaborative and cohesive? And at the time I had been working virtually since I started my business in um, 2001 but I thought, you know, I don't have enough data. I, I really need to understand a lot more at a deeper level what's going on for companies, who's doing this well, um, what's working and what's not. So that was at the time I was working with you. Um, and I believe I mentioned I wanted to, to do a uh, research study. And, and you were like, that's a real thought leadership type of, of option to consider. So I did it. I hired a psycho uh, psychological um, data firm who ran the study, built the study, right? They validated all the questions um, and we did a study and we got a pretty good response from a variety of Fortune 500 clients and employees who were working virtually or thinking about moving to virtual. And from there, we created a lot of data, a lot of output, white papers, blogs. I started speaking on that topic. I created programs for those clients that were asking uh, about how do we do this effectively? I shared what I was learning from my research. And that is when I was connected with and contacted by Wiley to write the book, Virtual Teens um, for Dummies in the, in the popular dummy series. Uh, and from there, I even dived deeper into research. So then I interviewed for that book, 
some of the top companies around the globe who are 100% remote to find out what they were doing, what was working, et cetera. So companies like Basecamp, Upwork, right? Those type of companies. Um, and I just learned a tremendous amount from my, my research. And that is what I think sets you apart as a thought leader, right? Because at the, at the time I was an expert, I would say, on what, how, how do we build trust on a team, right? How do we communicate? How do we give feedback? So I was really good at very practical how to's. Um, and I had been doing that for many, many years with my, with my clients. So definitely was seen as an expert, but I didn't have anything that really took me up a notch, right? To having an opinion, to sharing information that was unique, um, to sharing data that no one else had. And that's what really, I think, catapulted me into more of that platform. And now um, that's just continued to grow, yeah. which I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, so research study went into white paper, white mm -hmm. paper ends up leading to Wiley contacting you. You were out there speaking. You also focused on winning awards. You were I also, did. so you've won a shit ton <laughs> of <laughs> awards. I have. Talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, That was something early on. And I'll just say it to the community. If you could hear this, I heard this from a, uh, someone I was mentoring with at the time, probably 15 years ago, who said, go for awards, yeah. right? Like, put yourself in the arena, like get yourself out there. And I thought, why shouldn't I? I have really good programs. I have good ideas. I work with really good clients. Uh, and so I have been applying for awards for over 15 years and really have have just had some amazing experiences. I was I won an award uh, through HR.com. I was one of the top 10 leadership programs, voted on a panel of judges that were from the top Fortune 50 companies. And I stood on stage with like, you know, some of the biggest companies around IBM, GE, um, uh, BMW. And I was on stage there, my little boutique consulting company with my top 10 leadership award at Nashville, um, at in, in Nashville, Tennessee, you know, on one of the coolest music stages around. And so I have just had some amazing experiences uh, applying for awards, putting my work out there. Um, we're actually waiting to hear back on a pretty prestigious award if we win it for ROI that we we received on a recent leadership program. Um, so that'll be something I'll announce hopefully soon. I'm hoping we win. Uh, but the ROI was pretty unbelievable and transformative. So I think, you know, you just have to really be thinking about everything you do that is working. Make sure everyone can see, right? That culture of transparency. People are not going to get to know you if you are not putting yourself out there. And sometimes it does not have to be a big thing. We are a small boutique consulting company, right? We work with small startups and we work with Fortune 100 and 50 companies. Um, and some of our programs and awards were based on just the research I did, right? That white paper I wrote, um, a, a small training program where we had amazing results. It does not have to be this huge transformative thing to actually win an award. Um, so, so yeah, it's been, it's been a really amazing journey with that. Yeah. So one of the things about you standing on stage, I just want you guys thinking about the movements that you all are leading. And, you know, so Tara, here she is. She's up on the stage with BMW and, and IBM and others. There's a transference of credibility mm. when your brand mm -hmm. is associated with those leaders, right? There's there's a transference that goes that goes on of credibility and caliber. Um, there's a lot of quotes out there, right, about the company that you keep. And I think mm -hmm. Tara, one of the things you've really focused on is what are the rooms I'm in? What is the yeah. company that I'm keeping? Because that's giving me the ability to lead this movement. The other thing that you've done that I think is really brilliant, I want to talk about the things that are coming up, but you've also served on judging panels. Mm -hmm. And yes. that has given you an inside window to things because you're getting a look at things that other people aren't. I'm about. getting a look at the top learning and development programs in the world. It's 
mind blowing. And I have the, I'm, you know, I sign an agreement and I have to kind of keep anything that I see under wraps because I am a judge, but it has been one of the most rewarding and um, up leveling in terms of my own mindset of what's possible in this field uh, for me personally. So it really is helping me keep a pulse on what is going on in the learning and development industry. And I'll just say, you know, for all of you out there who are in this space, learning technology is where it's at. So if you didn't listen to Angelique's uh, show last week with Paul, Mm. who talked a lot about investing in tech, right? And how that tech is the future. It is the future in learning and development. So whatever you are doing, you want to start thinking about how do I uh, really start looking at the learning technology that's coming out and perhaps get involved in a small or big way, uh, because that is where it's heading. And I can tell you that based on the judging I'm doing with the biggest companies in the world. So, yeah. That's amazing. That's mm-hmm. an amazing gold nugget right there, you guys, that yeah. Tara just gave you what she can tell you from being on that judging panel, seeing the major corporations employ learning programs, because that's who's applying to these awards. So those major brands out there, they invest in employee training programs, and they submit those programs for awards. Tara is sitting on the, the judging panel year after year looking at what they're doing. So she has seen over the years the changes in what's yeah. really hot with those programs. That's one of the reasons I wanted you on my faculty um, because, because you have that, that inside track. So I want to take some questions uh, from folks who are watching. So if you guys have a question, uh, you can go ahead and type those in. We're going to grab some questions really quickly while we're writing, waiting for folks to, to ask some questions, Tara. You have two or three, just very quickly, you have two or three other things that are coming up as you're leading your movement to further raise your visibility and put even more of your thought leadership out into the world. So you have a new book coming out with yes. Yep. And that is all around working from home. So really meant to help the remote worker at any level. How do they work from home effectively? How do they use technology? How do they make sure they are creating, you know, a healthy uh, safe workplace for themselves. So that book will, should be coming out, I believe it in mid September. So you'll see that online and I'll be promoting it if you follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and then, um, probably within the next 30 days, I hope, you know, how long things take to see sometimes the light of day, we are going to be launching our virtual team remote coach app. So it is having an app, a virtual coach right in your pocket, and it is for remote team members to really help them navigate this whole new world of work uh, while they're working from home. So we focus on what do I need to do as a remote worker to stay engaged? How do I lead the way with that? Um, what are the things that I need to do to build virtual collaboration with my team members? Uh, we talk about health and wellness on the app and how do I maintain that? What are some things I need to be doing um, at health, you know, from home? Uh, we also talk about how do I run a virtual meeting? So if I am put in charge of running a virtual meeting, how do I do that effectively? Uh, so we talk about a lot of things that if you're a remote worker, you need to know. And it's just something that you bring up on your phone. Um, It coaches you. It offers nudge messaging messaging at a time that you, like, let's say I have a meeting with you next week, Angelique. Um, I might set a reminder that how to run this virtual meeting with, you know, I'm going to do this meeting with Angelique. I want a couple tips on how to run it effectively. 30 minutes before that meeting, these tips pop up. I can get coached. I can watch a video. It's just all right there in your pocket. So we're really excited. It incorporates uh, AI technology. Uh, Again, it's kind of getting into that learning technology space. So really trying to get into that space myself. And I'm just really excited about it. I think that's amazing. Well, yeah. I mean, it talks to the technology piece. It's really going to resonate, especially with millennials and Gen Z, yeah. right? Who kind of, you know, they didn't have pacifiers; they had apps, mm-hmm. and right, we're kind of born born in that tech space. And it's a way to make it integrated with our lives, which yeah. I think really the a big part of what we've been talking about today is really just the the blending. There is no mm-hmm. more work versus home, right? Yeah, I call it work life integration. Yeah. Basically. Which, Fully integrated at this point, right? Fully integrated. Um, Absolutely. 
Awesome. So if you guys have questions, definitely let us uh, let us know. And, and Tara can definitely uh, take a question of yours. Um, uh, there were definitely a couple of questions about Miro, and I think it's been mm. answered within the chat. But I just want to confirm with you that when you were talking about Miro, it's M-I-R-O. That's the spelling. Yeah. Right? Let me, I have to double check myself to make sure that's okay. correct. But uh, let me look here. Yeah. Yes, it is M-I-R-O dot com. Awesome. That's it. Yep. Awesome. And then. Um, and, and somebody said mural dot co. Awesome. Also very similar to Miro. They are two separate companies that do similar things. So they both. Yeah. And I see Marissa. Uh, Maricia said she prefers mural. Yeah. So they're both very good. And, and I don't. I'm not, you know, connected to either, but I'm just giving that as an example of some of the amazing collaborative tools that are available to make sure that creativity on a virtual team is happening. Yeah. Love it. And then yep. uh, someone who's watching us from Facebook today, so I don't know who you are, but thank you for your question, was just asking, what are you seeing for holographic meetings? Wow. And you know, it's so interesting because that came up in, in the green room discussion that I was having with Paul last week before we went live on the show. We were in the green room together and we were talking about holographics, especially because our event that's coming up, for those of you who don't know, yeah. we have an event coming up in October called Real Deal. It's realdealevent.com. Phenomenal event. We're going to be doing CCE credits for those of you who are coaches. Um, but he said, are you going to do anything with holograms? I'm like, well, not for this one. But, you know, we know that's a big, you know, holographics are a big thing. Are you seeing anything on that front or are leaders asking about it or is no. it still kind of further out? That's yeah. I have not had any companies that I'm working with. You, I have not been a part of using that or had them ask about it um, yet. So certainly care. I think that was Carrie Connick who asked that question. Those are the type of technology that we're going to be seeing, right? That is going to change actually, even the level of connection people feel to one another, because it's going to feel like you're right here with me, right in front of me. So I have not been in it. I don't know if anyone's been in a meeting like that. I have not had the opportunity to do that. But uh, I, that's the kind of technology that's going to help us you know, feel more connected and um, change this, you know, this feeling of disconnection through a computer screen. So I'm really excited about it for sure. One of the members of our community at the corporate agent actually did a meeting uh, prior to the pandemic where they had a local event, but they beamed in. I feel like it's like beam, beam it is. It's thought like, you, yeah. right? Yeah. They sort of beamed in a major thought leader to that meeting. I think one of the challenges with with the holog with, with the um, uh, with the holographics is that it works best when you actually do have a bunch of people together, together. and Correct. then there's one or two people who can't be there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work as well when we're all virtual. Right. It requires some sort of, you know, being together, but I think we're going to see more and more of that. I also, I have to say just as a personal pet peeve of mine, every time I read one of these articles that says, is this the end of whatever, right? Like <laughs> I've seen everything from this is the end of lipstick as we know it to this is the end of TV as we know it to this is the, I mean, like TV is probably the closest one that's accurate, but this is the end of conferences or this is the end of meetings or this is, and I think, you know, we need to be careful about not taking a myopic view of mm -hmm. what's happening. And I think things aren't necessarily going to go away. They're just going to be reshaped. Um, but I, I certainly think Tara, what we're going to see is a lot of reshaping of how much technology is used. One, yeah. of the, one of the things that we heard, and I'm curious if you saw this, was that companies were surprised by how many of their systems and processes actually had not been 100% digitized. So like- Yeah, and they, they did it in three days. And they did in three days, yeah. but they're struggling with onboarding new employees. Right. Because giving someone a badge, like now they're like, do they even need a badge? Mm -hmm. um, so how are they getting people onboarded? How are companies mm -hmm. onboarding new people? Yeah. So pre-pandemic, -pre uh, the companies that were 100% remote that I interviewed for the book, a lot of them that were doing that, it was a several phased process. So a new employee 
basically would fly to wherever the founders of the organization were located uh, and meet with them for a day or two to really get the download of the culture, uh, the need for their role in the organization, how that how that role impacts you know, wh what their vision is, what their strategic plans are, et cetera. And then um, that was the only thing they did in person was with the founders. So that now obviously could be done virtually, but then there was a kind of a uh, two to three week onboarding process with every team member and key stakeholder in the organization that impacted their success. And so that might've looked like a virtual lunch virtual happy hour with another person, uh, maybe uh, meeting with three of their team members to discuss some of their most key important security processes or protocols, um, showing them uh, doing some training virtually where they're learning the systems, et cetera. So it was a phased approach to onboarding, uh, certainly built in, the, in that two to three week onboarding process was team time obviously, right, with the whole team. And a lot of the teams that I work with are, you know, certainly using some type of assessment tools for those of us in the learning and development space are a simple and effective way to get to know a new team member, what their strengths are, right? We can use strength finders, what their uh, uh, information about their EQ, their emotional intelligence. Um, we also use DISC a lot to help understand different personality styles and then allowing team members to kind of talk about that together and sharing what's important when you communicate with them. So there are uh, absolutely effective ways to onboard uh, an employee. I think, again, it goes back to being thoughtful, intentional, building connection, you know, authentic connection time, one-on-one -on -one time, group time. I mean, that is the, the cadence that needs to happen in a virtual environment. Amazing. Yeah. Um, we have time for one last question, and then we're going to wrap up here. Mm -hmm. Josh was just asking about how are you seeing the role of HR and IT supply chain and other functions really being reshaped in mm -hmm. this post this post COVID COVID era? Yeah, I can speak probably more to the HR piece and maybe a little of the IT. Uh, but for for HR, I think it is really focused, again, on this um, building this sense of community and really figuring out how do we maintain a sense of culture when we are all virtual. And, you know, culture is going to continue to be such an important topic as we as we kind of move into this post COVID era trust has economic value on a team. And so I believe, you know, HR leaders are really going to need to, on one end, shape the policies, right, for working from home, those type of things that are going to shift. Uh, they may be directly involved with IT in security, uh, getting work from home setups in place that are uh, working for people, making sure their workplaces are safe, all of those things. But then there's going to be this whole other piece of culture. How do we instill culture? How do we create these com this sense of community on our team and in our company? And a lot of it goes back to, um, if you haven't read the book um, by Daniel Pink, new, uh, what is it? Your brain, hold on, I have it written down here. Um, I'll think of it here in a second. But it really is around your brain and what is it going to be required, you know, in the new world of work, a whole new mind. Thank you. I had it written mind. down. Yeah. And here's what he says. And this is what I believe HR is going to really be driving is the future belongs to a different kind of person with a different kind of mind. Creators, empathizers, pattern recogn recognizers and meaning makers, people that are artists, inventors, designers, storytellers, caregivers, big picture thinkers. Those are the things that we need in companies. And so I believe HR's focus is going to really be from a recruiting standpoint. How do we find those people? How do we make sure we are, you know, weeding through and sifting through um, and, and finding the right people to bring on to our team? How do we keep them engaged, keep their creativity flowing, using technology? I think HR and tech are going to IT are going to have to be working a lot more closely than they are today because they're. <laughs> the way that we connect and collaborate and build culture depends greatly on the technology that we're using. So that, you know, if I speak to anything that those are the two that I would say, I, I feel I have some insight into. 
Absolutely amazing. You've given us so much to think about, Tara, but I know there's more. How do yeah. people connect with you? How do they find you? Great. So powersresourcecenter.com is our website, and we have a lot of great free resources for remote teams. And uh, some of the new things I talked about today, we're going to be launching on virtualteamschool.com. And so those are probably the two best ways to find more information, but certainly reaching me, LinkedIn is a great place to do that. And Amazing. I'd love to connect with all of you. Amazing, Tara. Amazing. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. If you want to find us online, you can do that at thecorporateagent.com and make sure also you check out our upcoming conference, the Real Deal Conference, which is at realdealevent.com. It is definitely not something you want to miss if these no. are the kinds of organizations out there that you want to be working with and helping them to make changes from the inside out. All right, everybody, we'll see you back live next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, this is Angelique and Tara signing off. Have a great Bye -bye. day, everyone. Thanks.